Welcome to the Softball Coaches Rules Meeting. My name is Emily Gates and I am the OHSA Softball Sport Administrator. With recent staffing changes, we are handling softball a little bit differently this year. I will be your main point of contact throughout the season, but Senior Director Bob Goldering and Executive Director Doug Yu will also be assisting with some preseason and postseason materials. Also on the state rules meeting is our Director of Officiating Development, Jerry Thick, who will be detailing the NFHS rule changes, editorial changes, and points of emphasis later in the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to view this required rules meeting. A quick note before we continue, if you are using a Chromebook, we strongly recommend you stop and use a different device to view this presentation. If you choose to proceed with using a Chromebook, please be aware that your attendance may not record it or the presentation may stop. We've had some issues in the past of people using Chromebooks, and please also know that this is not the same as the Chrome Internet browser. It's its own uh, device. As you all know, the rules meeting is a requirement for all head coaches to view for all of our varsity sports. We always encourage any assistant coaches to view the rules meeting, but it is only required for the head coach to view this for the season. Attendance will be reflected immediately on your My OSHA profile, and the athletic director may also view this from their school profile on My OSHA. The purpose of the rules meeting is to remind you all about our OHSA administrative rules and to provide a few reminders on the NFHS rules reminders and most importantly, any NFHS rule changes and points of emphasis for the season. As we are all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic is ever changing and our organization, member schools and officials must be able to respond appropriately to guidelines and orders provided from the federal or national level. Things may look different from when you first view this rules meeting to the middle or even the end of the season, but the OHSAA will make sure to send out communication to necessary parties with any updates or information. Rule modifications and recommendations will be addressed later in this presentation as it relates to COVID-19 guidelines. We appreciate your understanding. In addition to the rules meeting, we have several resources that will be very beneficial to you prior to, during, and after the softball season and ask that you take some time to review these. First is the softball manual, which covers all items mentioned in this rules meeting in depth, along with frequently asked questions, and its purpose is to be a one-stop shop for any rules or regulations in the sport of softball. Also on the softball webpage are the general sport regulations and our tournament regulations. Please make sure to also review all softball coaches' memos. These are sent to the head coach listed on MyOSHA. Please make sure to review these as they provide important information and reminders specific to the time of the year they are sent. Last is the tournament information page. This will be more important closer to tournament time, but will have all necessary tournament information, including the brackets once they are posted. Moving on to the requirements to be a coach in the state of Ohio, um, let's talk about the Pupil Activity and Coaching Permit, otherwise known as the PAP. So this is an item that is required by law in the state of Ohio for all coaches to obtain. This is a reminder that this is for a paid and any volunteer head coach or assistant coach on your staff. This is the first of many times you will hear this, but all volunteer coaches are treated the same as paid coaches with respect to our rules and regulations, so please keep that in mind. So to obtain the PAP, an individual must complete the six listed requirements that you see. So they must hold a current and valid CPR card, complete an approved sports first aid course, complete and submit a background check, complete the NFHS Fundamentals of Coaching course, and as well as the concussion course, which is valid for three years. And new to um, this past year, all coaches must view the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Education video, otherwise known as Lindsay's Law. Um, this is made by the Ohio Department of Education, otherwise known as the ODE. Um, they will issue the required PAP, which is valid for a three-year period. Concussions have been at the forefront of injury prevention the last few years, and with that, concussion prevention deservedly should be addressed. Coaches and officials continue to have the authority to remove players for exhibiting the signs or symptoms of concussions. 
The required first aid training that we have from the concussion course from the NFHS Learn website for both coaches and athletes will help both parties recognize concussion symptoms. We also have concussion resources on our website. We have a sports safety and concussion resources tab under our sport medicine area. So please, if you do not feel comfortable in this area, please view this information even if it's just a refresher. Any player that is removed from a practice or contest cannot return to participate on the same day as being removed for symptoms of a concussion under no circumstances. Please pay attention to your athletes and concussions and visit our concussion resources page on our website. Moving on to some of the OHSA administrative rules, coaching, tryouts, and instruction may begin on Monday, February 22nd. Please remember that only the listed may take place prior to February 22nd and none of the lists can be made mandatory. No instruction or drills from the coaching staff are permitted during weightlifting, conditioning, or open gyms. Coaches may supervise these programs, but again, there can be no skill or instruction taught during these programs. Everything must be voluntary and student-led. Any open gym or field must be considered free and unstructured play. Though I will cover it in a bit more detail, the individual instruction regulation should be a great benefit to coaches, allowing them to work with their players anytime inside or outside of the season, with the exception of the no contact period, which occurs from August 1st to August 31st. The first state games are permitted for the 2021 season is Saturday, March 27th. There may be no games played prior to the state. If there are, a penalty will be applied, which is removal from the postseason tournament. We realize this is a later season start date and that it may conflict with spring break trips you tend to take as a school team. Moving on to some more administrative rules, let's start with scrimmages. So each sponsor team at your school is permitted four scrimmages, and those scrimmages can be held any time during the season, including during tournament time. There's no limit to the number of teams that can participate in a scrimmage. However, there is a limit of three hours of competition. If you participate against two other schools on the same day, as long as it's on the same day, it counts as only one scrimmage. Previews may be held between the start of the season and your first contest, and admission may be charged. The main aspect of a preview is that it may only be one half in length. Previews are only permitted by rule to be half of the game. If you are possibly playing against two opponents in a preview, the total length may still only be one half. Once practice begins, please know you are not mandated to hold a specific number of days for tryouts or hours per day. There's no limit to the number of players you are permitted to keep on your roster, but please remember that there is a limitation of roster size during tournament time. Softball teams are limited to 27 games throughout the season on 27 playing dates. If any school exceeds the 27 scheduled game, it results in removal from the postseason tournament. Please remember that there may be no more than two games scheduled on one day, but there is a one-time exception for three games on a non-school day. For player limitations, each player may play on 32 playing dates. Keep in mind a double would, header would count as one date. This also forces the coaches to track this carefully. And just like the contest limitations, exceeding 32 contest that a player participates in results in player ineligibility. I definitely want to address playing contests with out-of-state schools, as your sport is one of the sports we see most with schools traveling out-of-state. So a bit of general information, you are permitted to scrimmage out-of-state, and the biggest component is that the contest or scrimmage you participate in must be classified the same for both schools participating. So if your team is traveling to Florida to play in what you have scheduled as a scrimmage, it must be counted as a scrimmage by the team you are playing against as well. So the Ohio school can't count it as a scrimmage when the other school is classifying it as a game. You cannot travel out of state for practice only. Um, you may practice if you have a scrimmage or a game scheduled. All games must be played by the official NFHS rules in the sport, and all games must have licensed officials from that state. So also keep in mind that the Ohio administrative rules must be followed as well. 
So if you are traveling to a bordering state, this is permitted an unlimited amount of times throughout the season. You are permitted to miss school time. And again, you are permitted to practice while out of state for a scrimmage or game. And if you are traveling to a non-bordering state, you are only permitted to do this one time per season, and you are now permitted to miss school time. Um, this is new for 2021, um, but again, you are permitted to practice while out of state for that scrimmage or game in a not bordering state as well. On the subject of games, something that has grown in importance the past few years needs attention as part of this meeting. Things to consider when you agree to play an opponent. First, all games are agreed upon by a formal written contract. League schedules are considered binding agreements as well. When you agree to play a game, you are agreeing to just that, to play the game. So you cannot drop on an opponent midstream just because you don't want to play them, nor can you drop an opponent just to make a league game up instead. But, and I know this is done regularly, if both teams agree to not play, of course you can do that, but the opponent has to agree. You also have to agree to make a game up that is suspended or canceled, again, pending whether both teams agree not to do so. I mention this in detail as more and more contract disputes are coming into our office for resolution, and it becomes rather easy to deal with. A contract is a contract. And you may find this hard to believe as it is becoming more and more of an issue, but entering into a contract is also an agreement to the umpires hired for the contest and the decisions made by those umpires. So things to consider when contracting a game, you are agreeing to the umpires that will work the game, you are agreeing to abide by all decisions of the umpires, you agree to play the game, and you agree to make up the game if canceled. Before going into too many rules, I just wanted to remind you of the definition of a member of a school team. So a student is defined as a member of the school team once they participate in a scrimmage, preview, or contest for the school team. By OHSA regulation, players are permitted to participate in any non-interscholastic program until they participate in one of the above for the school or the start of the season date, whichever comes first even if they have already been practicing with the school team. Once they participate in a scrimmage, preview, or contest for the school, they may no longer participate in any non-interscholastic program until their season has concluded. The sports regulation that you will probably deal with the most is General Sport Regulation 7, also referred to as the non-interscholastic rule. This regulation addresses what can and cannot occur inside and outside of the season. During the season, players may not work out, try out, or participate in any way with any non-school program. So this includes travel, legion, club, church, etc. They may also not work out, try out, practice, or participate with any type of college ID camp or showcase. And there is a exception for 2021, which I will discuss in a moment. But if a student athlete violates sport regulation seven, they are immediately considered ineligible for the remainder of the season. And just a reminder that using an ineligible player means a forfeit. And also a quick note, players can receive outside private instruction during the season as long as it is individual skill training and not any type of team play. So as I mentioned, new for 2021, we are providing a college ID camp waiver. So this is due to the changes in the NCAA recruiting periods. So this allows a student athlete a one-time waiver for the spring of 2021 to attend an identification camp after the student athlete has participated in a school scrimmage preview or game. So this waiver only applies to individual works out, workouts and camps that are put on by a college college or university, so not any type of team or club showcases. And all of these events must take place prior to the start of the 2021 spring tournament postseason. So upon returning from the ID camp, the student athlete must follow all school policies to return to scholastic team play as well. And this waiver must be submitted to me for approval prior to the event with uh, approval from the coach and the athletic director.
Sports Regulation 7.3 limits the members of any non-school team to 50% of the roster, so four, that played for a school team the previous season. The 50% limitation is not in effect from the Friday prior to Memorial Day to July 31st. During this time frame, there may be more than four players from the same school team participating together on a non-school team or program. So in summary, there may be no more than four on a non-school team from the same school. Please note that graduating seniors do not count, and if they did not play for the school team last season, they do not count either. We also consider grades 7 through 8 separate from grades 9 through 12. So, for example, you could have four 8th graders and four 9th graders on the same non-school program, even if from the same school or school district. We also permit indoor softball, but it must be played indoors between November 1st and February 1st. If you take a look at all of the items on the screen, these are the ways you can coach outside of the season. First is the individual instruction regulation, which I will cover in a bit more detail here in a few moments. But the key pieces to remember are you cannot provide individual instruction during no contact periods. You are limited to six student athletes in all combined facilities and weightlifting may occur at the same time. So there may be no open gyms or conditioning, that type of thing. It just needs to be individual instruction. For open gyms, we kind of covered those already, but just keep in mind that they are not permitted during the no contact period and there may be no instruction. Also, in previous years, all sport coaches were limited to only working with more than 50% of their athletes for a total of 10 days throughout the summer. This rule has been eliminated for 2021, so you may coach an unlimited amount of your players from June 1st to July 31st without a 10-day restriction. And just a reminder that a school coach is permitted to coach their own student athletes on a non-school team outside of the season as long as the 50% limitation is applied. Again, the 50% limitation is not applied during the summer months. A few more details on coaching your own players from your school team and team play outside of the season. Like I said, you can coach your school players on a non-school team, but you cannot coach them during the no contact period, which for spring sports is August 1st to August 31st. There remains a limit of four players from your school team on your non-school team roster. This should happen anyway, since there are only allowed to be four players on a non-school team during this time. But please reference the sport webpage for more information and also the frequently asked questions in the coach's manual. Now moving on to the individual instruction regulation, sport regulation 8.3. So the purpose of this is to allow coaches the opportunity to provide instruction that is not permitted for time in open gyms or fields and to provide that same type of instruction outside of the season that private instructors can. So it's really great if you're able to, you know, work with a smaller focus of student athletes, um, maybe focusing on different areas, that type of thing. But keep in mind that this is just for instruction and it is not an opportunity to hold a full additional practice outside of the season. So what you can do, this is where the update um, occurs for Sport Regulation 8.3. You are now permitted to instruct up to six individuals in all combined facilities. And just keep in mind again that it can only be individual skill instruction. So hitting, fielding, or pitching techniques are examples. It can't be any type of team play. So what you can't do, you can't do team drills with more than six individuals present. Um, one example of this is if you're providing pitching techniques to six on the field while there are six others in a cage hitting. It is six individuals present in all combined facilities. One topic that you might not have to deal with too much is dealing with student athlete transfer issues. The first thing you need to do is consult with your athletic director as this is a school administrative issue to deal with. They must meet one of the transfer exceptions to participate. Depending on the outcome of the transfer information, student athlete transfers must sit out of the second half of the season in the OHSA tournament. As soon as you know you have a student athlete who is a transfer, please consult with your school administrators so they may start any necessary paperwork. One of your requirements as head coach is to rate your officials after your game. 
It is an important part of the tournament assignment process and is now required by OHSA regulation. Rating assures the coach's input is into the tournament assignment process. The process takes place in the Myosha system by logging into your Myosha account that is associated with your school profile. You will be reminded of this important requirement throughout the season. The OHSA wants to reiterate that no matter how you feel about the officiating, please do not ever take your team off the field and go home. If done so, penalties shall apply, including a meeting with the OHSA Executive Director and possible suspension. And just a quick reminder, as media coverage and social media websites continue to put more and more focus on high school teams, think first before any negative comments are made on or to a media outlet. OHSA regulations prohibit negative comments and any public criticism of officials in the media, and that includes social media. And please remind your players. We hope this is a topic that you don't have to deal with much, but to cover ejections, here's what happens. When a player is ejected, he or she is to remain in the bench area under the supervision of a coach or school administrator. The last thing we want is an ejected player running off to the locker room, school, or bus. They must be supervised. They are also ineligible for any contest for the remainder of the day. For example, if they are ejected from a JV contest, they are ineligible for any other contest that day, such as a varsity game. They are also ineligible for all contests until two at the level of the ejection have been played. During the time of the ejection, they may practice with the team, but are not permitted to ride to and from the game with the team, nor are they permitted to sit in the team area, dugout, or be in the locker room prior to, during, or after the game. The players may not be in uniform and cannot participate in any part of warm-ups. If you as a coach are ejected, you are required to leave the facility immediately. The coach is ineligible to coach in any contest for the remainder of the day of the ejection and also is ineligible to coach in games until two games at the level of the ejection have taken place. An ejected coach may not sit with the team, be in the dugout, may not be in the locker room prior to, during, or after the game. They may sit in the stands, but they cannot be giving instruction from a different location. Additionally, any ejected coach must complete the NFHS Teaching and Modeling Behavior course and must pay a $100 fine to the OHSA's Respect the Game program. Even when officials do not notify the school, the ejection protocol must still be enforced. And please remember that there are no appeals over ejections. The lightning and inclement weather policy is one that is a national rule in all 50 states. The sound of thunder or the visible sighting of lightning necessitates an immediate 30 minute delay in play. Even when you are at the 29 minute mark in thunder sounds, here we go, but another 30 minute delay begins at that point. As we all know, Ohio struggles with severe weather during the spring season, so make it a point to know your school's crisis management plan. One important reminder that I do provide is an important one relative to the administration or management of a contest. As you know, as a head coach, being a head coach entails so many responsibilities beyond simply coaching. Sometimes overlooked is the fact that our regulations require someone to be responsible for the contest itself, even if it is a JV or junior high game. Oftentimes, especially in sub varsity games, that someone is the coach. We have made it a point to remind coaches and athletic directors of this responsibility. These responsibilities include safeguarding officials before, during, and after a contest, dealing with unruly fans, and dealing with medical emergencies, coordinating inclement weather crisis plan, and any other things that may come about during a game. You really should take a moment or two with your JV coach and review a few items on this before his or her first contest. Part of the responsibility and the game limitation from OHSA regulations is being able to describe what a completed game means. So a game is considered complete if the coach and the play umpire mutually agree to end a game early. So one example is when a team has a tremendous lead and both coaches agree to end the game. Anytime a team has a 10 run lead and the losing team has completed its turn at bat in the fifth inning, 
when the home team takes a 10 run lead in the fifth inning and when the game has gone beyond the fifth inning and the game is called for any reason. The score stands and the game is over unless it meets one of the following exceptions. Now this is where it can get a bit confusing, so let's take a look at what happens after the fifth inning. If a game is called or suspended prior to the completion of a full inning after the fifth inning and the visiting team has scored one or more runs to tie the score or to take the lead and the home team has not retaken the lead, the game is suspended. If any time after the fifth inning the home team is ahead going into the bottom half of the inning and the game is stopped, the game is over. This is an Ohio required regulation. Schools and or leagues are not afforded the luxury of deciding whether they want or don't want to follow this. It is required. If a suspended game is never made up, it simply goes down as a no contest and you can replace it with another game on your schedule. There are many situations in which a suspended game is completed prior to the start of another game, as is often the case in league games. Regardless of the number of innings, you can do this without counting it as a doubleheader. This is important for games during the week. Just a reminder, it, when a suspended game is completed, it shall be continued from the point of suspension with batting orders in the lineups the same. Substitutions may be made and any player that may have been suspended from the original contest is suspended and not able to play in the resumed game. I receive inquiries about field diagrams and several questions about things like where the fence or dugout should be located, that type of thing. This field diagram is located in the NFHS rules book. If you do not have a rules book, we can provide you one for a fee at the OHSA office or if you are working on building a new stadium or field, those individuals can reach out to me with any questions regarding requirements for the field. Looking ahead to tournament time, I wanted to address how our tournaments are structured. The OHSAA is made up of six athletic districts, with each district electing nine representatives to a district athletic board. The function of the DAB is to organize and run the sectional and district tournaments in their respective districts. The number of teams in a division in a district determines how many teams are permitted to qualify to the regional tournament. This explains why, for example, the Northwest receives more Division III regional qualifiers than the Southeast District. There are simply more Division III teams in the Northwest than there are in the Southeast. The OHSA staff directly coordinates the regional and state tournaments, but all our levels are conducted under a set of adopted tournament regulations, which are located on the softball webpage. Please see the posted dates for this year's regional and state tournaments. This is a great time to also encourage you to become a member of the Ohio High School Fast Pitch Softball Coaches Association. The Coaches Association makes annual recommendations to the OHSA's Board of Directors, so please make sure you are working with them if there are any issues or areas of improvement in the sport of softball. There are several of the Coaches Association board members listed on the screen, but we recommend you take a moment to go to their website to see their list of district officers, as these would be great individuals to reach out to. I will now turn it over to Director of Officiating Development, Jerry Fick, to cover the NFHS rule changes, major editorial changes, and the points of emphasis. Our first change has to do with damaged bats. A damaged bat is defined as one that was once legal but is now uh, broken, cracked, dented, what, whatever. It's removed from the game without penalty. We're going to go into a lot more detail about bats in our points of emphasis section, but at this point we need you to understand the definition and that the bat is removed from the game without penalty. The next change has to do with pitching, and the pitching pitcher's pivot foot must now be in contact with the pitcher's plate versus the previous rule which required it to be on top of the pitcher's plate. The slide on the left, slide A, shows the foot on top of the pitcher's plate. This is still just fine. The slide on the right shows the foot touching the pitcher's plate. This is also fine now. So the change is that the foot need no longer be on top of the plate simply in contact with the plate. There are a number of diagrams in the rule book, page 50, figure 
that show both legal and illegal placement of the feet. Please note that diagram number six on page 50 is the one that we indicated earlier in the presentation is legal as there was a printing error on that diagram. This particular slide also shows a number of situations that help us understand what is illegal and legal. Keep in mind that the pivot foot as well as the non-pivot foot must be entirely or partially within the 24 inch length of the pitching plate. Therefore, although the pivot foot in the first diagram, the one on the left, is in contact with the pitcher's plate, it is not within the 24 inch length of the pitcher's plate. That particular starting position would be illegal. The remaining starting positions show the foot within contact with the pitcher's plate and also within the 24 inch width of the pitching plate. Therefore, the three diagrams on the right are all legal. Whether both feet are in contact with the plate or the, only the pivot foot is in contact with the plate, the pitcher still must take or simulate taking a signal from the catcher while on the rubber. This is an important item and probably should be a point of emphasis just about every year. We cannot allow pitchers to simply walk onto the rubber and pitch without simulating taking a signal or taking a signal on the pitcher's plate. There has to be the pause to do that. The actual signal can be taken well on the pitcher's plate or standing behind the pitcher's plate or elsewhere. It can be taken from anyone. It can be a verbal call obtained from looking at a wristband. However, the pitcher must then take a, pitcher, a position on the pitcher's plate with the hands separated and simulate taking a signal from the catcher. This is a safety issue and a fairness issue for the batter. The failure to make this pause and simulate or take a signal uh, from on the rubber with the hands together is an illegal pitch. This is an important item that we need to work on this year. The next change is what I would really call a cleanup in uh, how a run scores. And we're going to take a look in the next slide at how this works. A fly ball is caught for the second out. Both runners tag with the runner on third leaving early and scoring. The runner on second leaves legally and advances to third base. There's then an overthrow and that runner is awarded home plate. The defense then appeals that the runner on third left early. In this play, no runs would score because the following runner cannot score when the preceding runner is called out for the third out of an inning on appeal. Moving on to the NFHS softball major editorial changes. First, we have some new language clarifying that media areas must be in dead ball territory. This was a rules change last year and uh, it's been clarified a bit. Uh, this uh, illustration actually shows very well uh, some potential locations for media areas. Note that they're all in dead ball territory. The reason for this change is obvious. Uh, there's a number of reasons for it and um, we discussed it extensively last year. The key thing to know is no media areas in live ball territory. Earlier we discussed the new mark that has been added uh, for uh, a legal bat. This is the USA Softball Certified Mark. It's found on page 12 of the rule book in figure 1-6. Please note that the words all games are not part of the actual marking and you can see the actual marking on the rule book page 12. This is another cleanup item. Language has been added to clarify that when the catcher stops a wild pitcher's pass ball with detached equipment, 
the batter is not awarded a base. Only the batter runner would be awarded a base. Now moving on to the NFHS softball points of emphasis. Let's talk a little bit about bat certification marks and we'll talk about these more later. There are now three legal bat certification marks. All are from ASA USA Softball. The 2000 certification mark, the 2004 certification mark, and this year's new USA Softball certified mark. Let's say that a coach brings a bat to an umpire that has another organization's marking. The coach claims that since it's been approved by another organization, it's acceptable for high school play. The ruling in this situation is the bat is not approved and may not be used. All bats, and we will talk about this later in the meeting as well, all bats must bear one of these certification marks. First of all, many of you will recall that in 2019 we had a good deal of confusion concerning bats. We're going to try to make that a little simpler and review it this year. Number one, the bat must have one of these three markings in order to be legal. We've talked about the new marking, which is in the center of the USA Softball certified marking a couple times already in this meeting. So what's new for this year is that a damaged bat is now removed from the game without penalty. This includes a bat with cracks, dents, whatever. In, a, in addition to bearing one of the three certification marks, a bat may not, and I repeat, not appear on the USA Softball's non-approved bat list. This bat list can be printed from the USA Softball website and umpires should carry the list with them. Remember that an altered bat or a non-approved bat results in the ejection of both the player using the bat and the head coach. There is no warning. This is covered in Rule 742. We'll talk extensively about bats later on as this is a major point of emphasis for us this year. Obviously noise making devices are not permitted in the dugout. That includes musical instruments, horns, bells, whistles, whatever. It's also not permitted to bang items such as ball bat buckets or banging bats on dugouts or fences. These situations can quite often be handled quickly with a warning, but repeated violations need a restriction of the bench or ejection of either the coach, the offender, or both. Jewelry. We talked about it earlier and it is a point of emphasis for us. Remember it's covered in Rule 3212 and uh, uh, there's numerous examples of what jewelry is, uh, it consists of, but uh, remember it doesn't need to be metal. It can be the rubber bracelets, the cloth or string necklaces, other decorative items that are all illegal. The penalty for violations include a team warning on the first offense, and of course in addition to removing the item, with subsequent offenses resulting in a bench restriction to that subsequent offender and the head coach. Too often umpires seem to want to take the easy way out and ignore jewelry situations or other safety rules or policies. This is dangerous for you, the student athlete, the coach, everyone, and it's something that we really need to do better on. Remember that religious medals can be worn, taped, under the uniform. Medical alert medals can be worn, taped, visible. And as I mentioned earlier, day ear piercings are permitted, but they must have the waiver from the OHSAA with them and show it to you. No waiver uh, present at the game, then either the day ear piercing cannot be worn or else the student athlete cannot play in the game. With guidance from the NFHS, the OHSAA and the Ohio Department of Health have established rule modifications for the sport as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please know that we created NFHS rule modifications and there are also requirements and recommendations that must be followed throughout the year. Rule modifications are required to be implemented and there may be additional modifications added throughout the season.
The goal with the softballs for the season is really trying to minimize the number of people that come into contact with the ball. So each team shall supply game balls for use while they are on defense. A minimum of three balls are to be handed to the home plate umpire at the beginning of each half inning. When a ball goes out of play, the defensive team shall retrieve the ball and provide another game ball to the home plate umpire. At the end of each half inning, the pitcher shall take the game ball with them to the dugout and the catcher shall take all of the other balls from the home plate umpire to the dugout. Just a reminder, the softballs must meet all NFHS requirements and be new or in good condition. Players and coaches should use their own equipment whenever possible. If equipment must be shared, so items like batting helmets or the baseball bats that are typically more shared than other equipment, proper sanitization is required between the use of each piece of equipment. Player and team equipment shall be sanitized before and after each practice or game. Players are not permitted to share water bottles and there is no permission of team water coolers or shared drinking stations. All player personal items shall be properly separated and not shared as well. And we also have a few recommendations that you might consider at your school or site. It is recommended that sunflower seeds, gum, and similar products be prohibited on the field. Um, and it is also recommended that each team consider having an equipment handler to remove bats and helmets from the field of play. This just would remove the umpire feeling like they need to remove the bats or helmets from the field. Regarding masks or facial coverings for players, they are recommended but not required while on the field of active play. However, they are required by all participants when they are not participating, so this would be in the dugout or bench area. If a facial covering is worn on the field, it may be of any number of colors, but must not be the color of the baseball and not be distracting with some kind of wild design. Uh, gators may be worn as face coverings, and just keep in mind that if face coverings are worn only when not participating, on the field or in the dugout or bench area, there are no color or design restrictions. Now for coaches and other team personnel, face coverings are required at all times. So this includes during arriving and departing the facility and during active play. And gaiters may be worn as face coverings for coaches or team personnel. And just make sure to review the Ohio Department of Health sports order for any medical exceptions. Per guidance from the NFHS Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, the plastic face shields covering the entire face shall not be used unless they are integrated into the face mask and attached to a helmet. Um, the reason because of this is the use of these hard items during practices or contests can increase the risk of unintended injury to the person wearing the shield and their teammates. There are a few limitations to the in-game pre-game conference. Um, attendees are limited to the head coach only from each team plus the umpires. The coaches need to make sure to stay outside the width of the batter's box at home plate, maintaining six feet of distance between each person, and everyone attending this meeting must wear a facial covering. To eliminate too much exchange of the lineup cards, the lineup shall be handed to the umpire and the umpire will verbally approve or ask any questions about the lineup. It is also recommended that lineup cards exchanged team to team and team to scorekeeper be shared electronically if possible, but again, this is not a requirement. For substitutions, all verbal exchanges should occur six feet from the coach or sub to the plate umpire. Subs shall be announced by the play umpire to the opposing team's coach, again following six feet social distancing. Please note that coaches holding defensive conferences must stay on the plate side of the circle and the player or players must be on the opposite side of the circle, maintaining the six feet social distancing. Only one coach is permitted during the conference and when a coach visits the pitcher, all other players shall stay six feet apart. Team huddles without physical distancing are prohibited. It is the responsibility of the coach to ensure that players are legally equipped and the players and equipment is in compliance with the NFHS and OHSA rules 
the ODH bonifications and your local health department orders. Just another quick reminder that coaches shall wear face coverings at all time unless they meet a medical exemption. And we, I've kind of alluded to it a few times, but we just want to make sure that umpires are not handling the team equipment on the field during play. And any coach who wishes to discuss a rule or ruling on the field must maintain at least six feet of physical distance from the umpire. And a quick note to base coaches, um, please stay six feet from all runners at all times. For the bench and field conduct, we will definitely need coach and team personnel um, making sure that our players and coaches are following these orders. Players are not permitted to leave the dugout area to congratulate players scoring or after home runs. And the number of individuals in the dugout is dependent on the size of the dugout. So we really want players and coaches to try to maintain six feet of social distance within the dugout. And NFHS rules does allow for the dugouts or designated warm-up areas to be extended to provide for social distancing. So if needed, these areas shall be clearly marked and located beyond the end of the dugout furthest from the home plate to ensure that six feet of social distancing. As we have applied to all of our sports seasons this year, we need to ask that players and coaches refrain from high fives, handshakes, and any other physical contact with teammates, opposing players, coaches, umpires, and fans. A tip of the cap or other non-contact gesture can be used following the game in lieu of the handshake line. It is really important to note infractions by the pitcher. So the pitcher is not permitted to lick her fingers and wipe them off. Pitchers are not allowed to put their hands to their mouths or blow in their hands prior to pitching the ball. If either of these happen, this will be considered a no pitch and the ball is dead immediately and any umpire is permitted to make this call. If that occurs, the ball will be replaced and sanitized and the pitcher must sanitize her hands before play continues. A pitcher using a resin bag or comparable drying agents shall take the item to the dugout at the end of each half inning. Please note that this is not an exhaustive list of the COVID-19 guidelines, but I did just want to cover especially the rule modifications and majority of the requirements. And just a quick note, once these are approved by the Ohio Department of Health, they will be posted to the COVID-19 correspondence webpage. We also just need to all make sure we're working together to make sure everyone is following these guidelines. So make sure you're also working with your local health department in case they have any possibly stricter rules or that kind of thing. And we get the question about compliance with the rules. So compliance will be evaluated throughout the season by COVID-19 observers. We had these observers attend sport sporting events in the regular season and postseason in both the fall and winter sports and plan to have them in place for the spring as well. And just the last note of just remembering to be flexible and understanding this year. We understand that you may not agree with all of the rule modifications or recommendations put in place, but these are the guidelines put in place so we're able to have a season. We have many, there are many state associations across the nation that are modifying their season, condensing the postseason, that kind of thing. And Ohio is one of the only states that has been able to have our entire regular seasons and postseasons without too many modifications on the season. So just keep that in mind moving forward, and we look forward to this great year. You have now completed the state softball rules meeting. Please check your MIOSHA profile for your state meeting attendance, which should be reflected on your MIOSHA profile immediately. We thank you for your time in reviewing this presentation, and we look forward to working with you this year. Have a great season.